spirit form that connects your bodies together, that connects your spirit form with your material form. Now this band stays intact until the material body cannot any longer sustain life. So as soon as that occurs, the cord breaks. Now you have not had your cord break, so you are still connected to your spirit body and your soul. But while you're maintaining a back-off type connection, and if you're a mediumistic, a spirit can also connect through that cord. So here's a spirit's spirit. Let's just say that's a spirit. Remember the spirit is a spirit body and a soul, right? Can connect through that cord into your body and actually motivate you through your brain and your intellect and everything to do all sorts of things you would not normally do. Uh, it can that be a good thing? Um, I would suggest to you that although often there are good results from it, any time that you disconnect from yourself is not a good thing. Right? right? The reason why is what we want, if we want to become at one with God, which is our goal, right? We need to become at one with God. That means all of you, physical body, spirit body, soul, all needs to be together and functioning perfectly to become at one with God and not be influenced by other things. The problem is, is that this is often happening on earth today where people are quite distant from themselves physically and they have spirits, what I would call, this is really like an overcloaking, if you like, that is occurring. And this overcloaking that's occurring is actually motivating us to do many things that we wouldn't perhaps normally do. And that's why many people, at the moment they have this experience, when they get this overcloaking experience, their life almost changes like 180 degrees to some other kind of life, right? And, and it, it is allowed by the sole condition of you of wanting to run away from your life. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And if you want to be at one with God, you're going to have to stop running away from your life and actually start learning how to live your life and live your life totally in harmony with free will and love and all those other qualities. So, so a lot of times what happens is we, we, we're withdrawing from our own soul, right? Or withdra we're withdrawing from our body because we don't want this life. And while we're in this withdrawal state, a spirit can easily, if we're mediumistic in particular, a spirit can easily influence us. Now, a person who's an alcoholic is doing the same thing, withdrawing from their life, but they're just using the drink yeah. to withdraw. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So they're doing the same thing, but just using a different mechanism. So many of us have chosen to withdraw from our life, which then allows a spirit to have a heavy influence on us. Yeah. Okay? Thank you. Now, it's three o'clock, so already two hours have gone. And um, what I'll do, we'll have a break. Uh, let's make it, shall we, half an hour? Because I think you have a lot of questions, and there's a lot of spirits with you who have a lot of questions as well, and I want to have the opportunity to answer those questions. So let's have a break for half an hour the next time's homework is and then we'll go through a revision of last time's homework. I want to cover the next time's homework so you don't lose the sight of it. So we'll do that first. On the second page of your handout I've noted down the homework. Now, your own soul condition determines all accuracy of mediumship and effectiveness of healing. If you cannot feel and understand your own emotions, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to feel and understand with accuracy the soul condition of spirits who surround you. Now, can you see from our previous discussion why this is so important to you? Every single time you don't focus on your own emotions and deal with your own soul condition, no matter what words you say, your law of attraction with spirits will not change. It's only your soul condition changing that your law of attraction with spirits will change. For your soul condition to change, you need to actually allow yourself to feel your own emotions and experience them and release them. When you open yourself up and become more sensitive to feeling your own emotions, what happens is every single person around you, you can also feel their emotions. Right? Which also includes 
the spirits that are around you, you can feel their emotions. So if you're a medium and a spirit comes to you and they start nattering in your ear, figuratively speaking, um, and you're hearing a lot of words from them, the, way, the main way to determine whether this spirit is going to be helpful for you, harmful to you, whether you can be helpful to them or harmful to them, is through your feeling, feeling connection, your emotional connection. Does that make sense to everyone? So that's why it's so important. Now, if you choose to not do that, what happens is you're just going to trust the words coming at you. And to be frank, the words coming at you could be all sorts of things. Right? And many times they are. I've, I've seen spirits who believe they're connecting to the Archangel Michael who are connecting to first fear spirits in very evil conditions. And they themselves believe they're connecting to the Archangel Michael. So, it, and, and how do I tell? The only way I can tell is by being able to truthfully feel the condition of another person. Right? And this, this can be practiced in lots of different ways. One way it can be practiced is by going up to somebody and seeing whether you can feel their condition. Right? What, what do you feel coming from them? What kind of emotion is it that you feel? And actually maybe even writing it down and then ask him, do you feel this? Do you feel that? Now oftentimes they'll say no <laughs> because they don't want to feel those emotions. And remember it's the emotions they don't want to feel that are the emotions that you will feel from them the most. And the key for you is to allow yourself to reflect upon and feel those emotions coming from other people. Now, if I am not sensitive to my own emotions and I'm already shutting my own emotions down, is it going to be possible for me to feel the emotions of another person around me accurately? Of course not. And is it going to be possible to feel the emotions of a spirit who's around me accurately? Probably not at all. all right. So the whole point of the next exercise is to actually feel the emotions and the soul condition of spirits that surround you. Now for many of you, you've already got spirits coming to you, right? In different conditions. If you're a healer, often when you're laying the person on the table that you're healing, often what's happening is that you feel the different feelings of spirits coming around you, right? What you need to start doing now is after your patient or your client has gone, you sit down and write down what you felt about those spirits that were around you and that patient. Does that make sense? And what condition do you feel they were in compared to your own guides and compared to yourself and compared to the patient? What condition were they in? And when you often, when you're healing and you're scanning somebody across and you can feel there's problems in certain areas, ask yourself, is this a spirit attachment? Right? And, if, the, and you can, if you're a kinesiologist as well, you can test to see the body to see whether it is a spirit attachment. If it's a spirit attachment, ask yourself, what emotion in the person has caused this attachment? What emotion do I feel in the person that seems to be in this area of their body that I can feel seems to have caused this attachment with this spirit? Does that make sense? Ask yourself these questions about these spirits that are surrounding you and their emotional condition. What we want to do is start noticing the emotional condition of every single person around us, but also every spirit around us if we can. That's what we want to do. We want to become really sensitive to that. The more sensitive we become to that, the more power we will have in terms of being able to assist spirits in lower conditions, and the more power we'll have to listen to spirits in higher conditions than ourselves, which is our whole goal really, isn't it? Mediumship is a tool like that that we can use for the benefit of ourselves and for others. So we want to develop it in such a way that we can help others but also be helped ourselves through the gifts that we have. Now, you'll notice in the key point notes that I've got there, I just would like to read some of them. The soul condition, remember, is the governing force the force governing the accuracy and effectiveness of all gifts. And the greatest positive effect on our soul condition is prayer for divine love and trust in God. All right? Now, remember what prayer is. Prayer is not the words going to God. Prayer is the feelings you have inside of yourself going to God. All right? 
So remember that's what prayer is all about. It's not like you're going to be able to do some rope thing and pray and get some kind of response from God. You're going to need to have some feelings about God. And to actually receive divine love, you're going to need to have some feelings about God being an entity and feelings about God wanting to connect with you and feelings about you wanting to connect to God. And you'll be able to receive some of that love. And when that love stops, you know, I've got a blockage. Every time the love stops flowing through me, I know I've got a problem inside of me. God will always give me her love whenever I ask for it unless I myself am blocking it. So if I'm not receiving the love when I think I'm asking, there's something wrong with the asking. And I need to understand that and feel about that. Then, the negative or unloving emotions towards ourselves and others within us cause us to misinterpret guidance from the spirit world, attract spirits to us who can manipulate us or deceive us, cause the overcloaking from spirits who are in harmful conditions and cause the attraction of spiritual events that frighten us or we use to calm our fears. So we either do one or the other. False beliefs cause us the attraction of spirits who have the same belief system who, that we have and want to propagate that. The attraction of events such as past life regression events which support our belief structure and our unwillingness to open to God and her divine truth, to hear God's truth. So can you see that if our soul condition doesn't change, we've got a set of false beliefs that exist not in our head, they exist in our soul. So for example, I've used this example before. Many of you believe there's no problem with dying in your head. right? But when one of your loved ones dies, what happens then? You go into these terrible feelings of grief and a loss and all that. So, so the belief is only in your head. It's not yet in your soul. If the belief is in your soul, you wouldn't be crying. Because if you'd released all the emotions about the belief, and so this belief could be in your soul, you would actually be in just the same state as you were before they'd passed. Does that make sense? So, there is a big difference to you, you thinking something to be true and you knowing or feeling it as truth. And this is something that all of us need to understand. That if I don't feel it as truth, it is yet to enter me even if I think I know the truth. Now, the problem with coming to sessions like this is you get bombarded with truth which hits you here in your mind most of the time. But as yet, it's yet to sink down for many of us into here, into our emotional st state because we've got all these blockages which prevent the truth from actually sinking down into our emotions. Does that make sense? And so because we've got these blockages, and here's all these emotions right there inside of my soul, let's say, and they're all blocking this intellectual truth from actually reaching my heart, or what I call the figurative heart is the soul, right? So the truth is prevented from entering my soul or my heart because I've got a set of emotions which are opposite to the truth in my heart. Right? So, for example, I say the words, trust God. Here, that goes in here. But most of us don't trust God because we've got this emotion of, can I even believe God exists? I don't know. Can I be, even believe that God's trustworthy? I don't know. <laughs> you know, how, I've tried trusting God in the past when I was little and look what happened. Bad things still happened. So I can't, I don't know if I can really trust God at all. That's the emotion inside of me. Does that make sense? This emotion inside of me is sitting there stopping this intellectual belief which is a truth here of I can trust God from actually entering my heart, entering my soul. So I need to release the blockage before this truth can actually enter me. So understand that while you're hearing all of these things, it doesn't mean you know them. Now, many of us have clever intellectual minds. You know, they like this great big repository of information, right? And because of that, we have this great big store of information, like you think like a great big computer bank of hard disks all just stored there, right? All this information that we recall here, 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 away we go because we're quite intellectually clever. It means nothing. Because unless that truth has entered my heart, I still don't really believe it. 
I'm just replaying, replaying. I'm just like a computer, you know? Data in, you can trust God. Data out, you can trust God. That's all I am at that stage. I'm not actually feeling the truth, right, at that stage. To feel the truth, I'll actually know with all my heart that I can trust God in the example that I've given. Now, how does this relate to this exercise? Well, every intellectual belief you have is yet to enter your heart unless your life... And, sorry, when it enters your heart, your life instantly changes completely. All right? And this is the trouble, is we get the intellectual truth, my life doesn't change, get some more into it. Can't be the truth, right? Nothing changed. And the reason why nothing changed was because it went in here, but not down to here. Right? Now, what's in here determines, remember the soul condition? What's in the heart is what the soul condition is really about. So what we're saying here in this exercise is, it's important for me to feel my own soul condition. It's also important for me, if I'm going to be of any assistance to spirits or any assistance to people on earth, that I can actually feel their soul condition. Not, the, not what they tell me they think they know, not what they tell me they know, not what they tell me they even don't know, but what actually is in their heart. I need to be able to feel it. Now, to do that, I'm going to need to feel my own stuff in my own heart and be sensitive to that, which means opening up that. Now, everything that you can't feel in yourself, it's going to be very, very hard for you to feel in another person. That makes sense, doesn't it? And, and so, if I'm not open and sensitive emotionally, then I won't be open and sensitive to your emotions. And then I won't be open and sensitive to a spirit's emotions. So this is a very important exercise, developing, if you want to develop mediumship and healing, to develop your sensitivity to the emotions and feelings and projections coming from your environment. Now this is almost the opposite to what almost any person who's teaching you mediumship would say to do, isn't it? What they would say is, put a nice bright white light around you and, and like totally cover you with this white light and use all these different things, you know. Sometimes it even gets to be like this, you know, to keep all of the evil spirits away. That's what they would say, right? And I'm saying, don't do that. I'm saying focus on feeling every emotion inside of yourself and becoming really open and sensitive to those emotions and on feeling the emotions of everyone around you. That is the most powerful state you can be in. The reason why it's the most powerful state is you know what a person really feels rather than what they think they feel and even rather than what they're telling you and then you can relate to that rather than relating to this. Right. Now this is why many of you when I start talking to you, you start crying because <laughs> I'm not relating to you here. Right. I'm relating to you what's going on here and allowing different things that are going on here that you're not allowing in, even in your own self. You follow me? And th that's the thing you will learn, is the same thing as that, to, to relate to a person at the heart level, to actually know what's happening at the heart level. And to practice this with spirits is, is an awesome way to practice it. Now when you do this, you notice I've given you some homework there. I'm not going to read it because it's quite, I think, quite clear what the homework is. And... Um, but I'm going to be blunt with you about some things now. If you don't do your homework, don't bother coming to our next session. Okay? Now, I'm not saying to those who are coming just to observe. I'm saying if you're one of the ones coming because you're a healer or a medium and you want to develop your healing or mediumship, if you don't do your homework, don't come to the next session. Alright? Instead, Use that time to do your homework and come to the next session. Right? Because without you doing the homework, nothing's going to change. <laughs> and you'll come along after any year and say, you know, I did a year of this. I did by month after month, once a month or once every two months. I went to these things that AJ did. And after a year, you know, nothing changed. And I'll say to you, yeah, nothing changed because you didn't do your homework. 
<laughs> you didn't do what I suggested to do. It's only the doers of the word, not the hearers, but the doers that have the change. Right? So if you can bear that in mind. Another reason is because for me, my own love of self dictates that I'm giving you my time for free. If you can't give me your time in terms of doing something about what I've just given you for free, then we've got to start re-establishing a different arrangement, right? You've got to start valuing what you get for free. Right? So that's something just to bear in mind. Now that being said, it's a really good exercise if you can follow through with it. And if you can read the rest of the homework and follow through with that. You're all intelligent people, so I won't uh, dismiss your intelligence. You got some questions, Joy? Okay, um, uh, can we have Mike? Because we need to record it through the sound system. Um, do we all want to develop our mediumship skills? Um, I feel personally that there's no harm in every single person developing their mediumship skills and, and healing skills for that matter. In fact, as you when you become a one with God, it's very rare for you not to have good mediumship skills and good me and healing skills as well because it's an automatic process as a part of your abundant really. But it's lovely to develop it if you can, if you've got the time. But I would focus on your emotional development always. So if you feel like it's all too much, don't do it and focus on your emotional development. Yep. Um, so this is just if you want to develop it or for many of us, we're having feelings like we are already mediumistic and I want to know how to deal with it, you know, like how, to, how do I handle this, you know, and so, and how do I use that as a positive tool to help me progress. That's great too. So I'm not getting all autocratic with you, I'm just saying we need to get to a point where we don't waste each other's time. Do you follow me? And we need to value each other's time. I need to value your life. Your time is the only thing you can never recover in your life. Once you've spent it, it's gone. Now, while you have an infinite future ahead of you, what you've spent in the past is gone and you can't change that then. And I don't want to waste my time talking to a whole group of people who don't want to do what I'm saying. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And I'm not saying you have to do it, I just don't want to waste my time talking to a group of people who don't want to do it. <laughs> so so that, is, that is my right, isn't it? I'm giving my time for nothing. So that's my right to actually say that to you. My, your right is to say, well, I don't want to go to uh, these talks under, under that condition. Fair enough, don't go. Watch the DVD instead or whatever if you want to hear the information. What I'm saying is we want to have, when we come here, we want to have this attitude that we're going to become doers of the truth. Now I'm not suggesting that you've got to do what I say. What I'm suggesting is work out whether what I say is true or not, then do it. Does it do you follow me? I'm perfectly happy to come here in, in doubt and actually work through your doubts and all those kind of things and I'm perfectly happy for you to feel all of that and work your way through all of that but once you get to the point where you think it's true or you think it might be true, then start putting it into practice and see whether it is true. That's what I'm suggesting. Instead of just coming along and to have your ears, I used to say in the first century, your ears tickled, <laughs> right? Because that's what it's like sometimes, isn't it? We come along to the group because it feels nice at the group, right? We get a lot of truth and our soul sings while we get truth, so we feel good. And so this, this feeling happens and then, and then we walk away and we forget about it for the rest of the week and then we go back and it's like, and there's a, another illustration that uh, I use in the first century, it's like a man who looks at himself in the mirror, right? And then walks away and forgets exactly what he saw in the mirror. Right? Now most of us wouldn't do that, right? Most of us what we'd do is we'd look into the mirror and we'd go, yeah, you know, just get out the cream man. <laughs> You know, for the woman, woman a lipstick, yeah. You know, so we fix things up that we don't like, don't we? Is that what we do? So that's what we need to do with this too. So instead of ignoring just by hear, the, the problem with hearing is it requires no action. The truth is going to require action from you. Whatever it is, isn't it? If you think about it, might not be what I'm telling you, it might be some other truth, but whatever the truth is, is going to require some action from you. What I'm saying to you is, unless you put it into practice, you will never know whether this is the truth or not. 
So the key is to try, put it into practice, experiment with it for a week or a month or whatever you want to give yourself, a year or whatever time you want to give yourself, experiment for that time, then make some choices about that and decisions about that. But don't just keep coming, observing, keep coming, observing, keep coming, observing, keep coming, observing, but don't do it. Because you know what's going to happen? You're going to look back at the time that you kept coming and observing and not doing it in some time in the future and you're going to regret that you either didn't come or, in other words, that you, you wish that you didn't come because you wasted that time or you'll look back and you'll say, I wished I practiced it because I'd be ahead by now if I had of. <coughs> either way, you will feel a regret. So my suggestion is instead of doing that, you don't have to believe what I'm saying is true. What I'm saying is experiment with it to see whether it's true by putting it into action. You don't have to do that for very long. You'll see whether it will occur or not. If it doesn't occur for you, then go away and try something else. That's what I'm suggesting. Um, microphone. Is it, um, I have a worry though that if by focusing on the mediumship training, am I detracting from my own personal I'm no, if you focus on the mediumship training, you'll actually enhance your growth because the mediumship training, you notice that the, fir the very first lesson that I ta talked about was receiving divine love. The next lessons were about, about soul condition and, and, and about um, um, law of attraction. And then this, the last lesson was about fear. Now you think about it, if you deal with those emotionally, as I've suggested in those exercises, then that's going to also enhance your soul condition and help your own personal progression. So there's no way that what we're doing will actually harm your personal progression. It will, hit, it will help it a lot. Uh, the key is whether you have to have the time to do the exercises. But then I, I would also say to you, well, you know, these are the kinds of exercises that are worth doing even on a personal level to help you with your personal emotions anyway. All right? Particularly the first four or five lessons. Um, and then after that, we'll be getting into more practical things. Does that make sense? But for the first four or five lessons, they are the most important lessons of your development. The other ones are going to be more practical things and more filling in gaps. So the ones that come up in the next few months, they're going to start filling in gaps of like, how do we go about doing some healing then, now that we know all of these things? How do we go about doing our mediumship now, now that we know all of these things? How do we go about te talking to a spirit in the spirit world who's in a poor condition, now that we know all these things? How do we go about talking to a spirit who's in a good condition but scientific? You know, what do we do, what can we do to enhance that so that we can channel clear material? How do we go about that? They're all details, which we'll be covering later. What we want to do is cover the soul condition stuff which determines everything first. That's the, that's the important thing. Yep. All right. Um, AJ, I had an experience about a month ago where my hearing, it was like I was in a tunnel mm -hmm. and people were speaking around me but I, I couldn't hear what they were saying. I felt like a weight on my back or a pushing or a leaning on me and... I just want to know what that was, what was going on. What you need to do first is ask yourself the question, what did you feel? I knew you were going to say that. Because you started feeling the emotion just then when you were saying it. I felt I was being suppressed. Fear. Okay. So your fear. <sighs> oppression. and suppressed. Double P. What else? Any else? I couldn't speak. So you felt like you couldn't... I couldn't tell anybody what I was going through. Uh, I was breathing deeply. I remember focusing on breathing. Okay, now... Can you see this a relationship between these feelings and some childhood events? I knew it was childhood, but I can't remember the actual incident. All right. If you can't remember the incident, and, but you can still connect with the feeling, the key is to go into the feelings. What you did in this situation is try to get out of the feelings because you were afraid. 
Right? And what these spirits were doing, were, and I feel what your guides were doing, were bringing some spirits to, to you who would actually help you feel more oppressed. Yeah, so that yeah. you can connect with the feeling of being oppressed and suppressed, which is a feeling you've had a lot of your life that you need to experience. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, what they've done is they brought those spirits together te temporarily for you, around you. Those spirits didn't even really know why they were there. And that's why they were talking to each other and not talking to you, because they didn't really know why they were there. But their feeling that they projected at you was the feelings they feel, yeah. which is this deep oppression and suppression of emotions. The key for you, firstly, is to go into your emotion. And what you did instead was you tried to get out of your emotion. So now another time this is going to have to happen again. Okay? To get you back into the emotion. My suggestion is go into the emotion, even put yourself back there like you're doing now, back in your memory, into, and go into the emotion of oppression and into the emotion of trying to speak and you can't speak and feeling your terror and your fear because your body needs to... Your body needs to shake and tremble with this fear that you have about this, these events. These are some childhood events that it's related to, right? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. You can feel that it's related. You don't need to know what it's about at this point even. You can feel that it is related. So what you need to do is allow the relationship. This happened to me when I was little. I need to feel this. Does that make sense? Yes. Let you. yourself feel that. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Many times uh, what's happening at the moment for many of you is your divine love guides are trying to assist you on the divine love path. So what they're trying to do is create events that they can create for you to assist you to connect with different emotions that you're avoiding connecting with. And they'll do this quite constantly with you because they love you and they want to help you through those emotions. Um, microphone over. There, yeah, thanks. Um, AJ, I have had um, times when I was reading the pageant messages and, um, and when I'm praying um, and I'd go into this strange, um, like a, it wasn't sleep, it was a trancy type of state mm -hmm. and it went on for hours. I'd be sitting there and it, three hours would go by and I'd force myself out of this state and try to read another line. It'd go by line by line. Mm -hmm. And um, I wasn't sure what that meant, except now I'm under the understanding that it's my denial of wanting to hear this, what is being um, reading. And, and be careful of grabbing something I say to one person and yeah. then blanketly applying it to every person for yeah. a start. Yeah. It's not that for yourself. Oh, because I, I can't, because I really want to read, I want to know, it excites me what I hear. Yep. And it really gives me a lot of, um, gives me a lot of um, confidence about what's happening. Yep. So I can't understand why. Uh, I thought maybe it was spirits trying to stop me. Um, but I can't. And then the other question was, if I'm meant to feel what's happening, I don't know what I'm feeling because I'm not there. Okay. Well, let's, let's address the issue firstly. Many of you, while you're reading the pageant messages, have had moments where you can't remember what happened. I have, how many of you have had that actual experience? Right? So you might be reading along and then all of a sudden there's a blank gap in your time. And you come to, you don't know what's happened, but it's maybe an hour later, or five minutes later, or ten minutes later, but something happened in between that time. Now, there are two or three explanations for it occurring. The first thing is the first comment I made to, to Alex, and that is, and to, who was it? Somebody else was zoning out of, I can't remember now, but anyway. Um, but but what, what the first option is that I don't want to be here because of something I just read, right? And so I get out of body and, zone, and, go, and go away. That's one option. And the key is for you to ask yourself whether that happened to you. And you will soon feel it. You can also test your body with kinesiology and whatever to see whether that's what you were doing, if you want to, or get someone else to. So you can easily test for these things to see what your true intention was. 
My suggestion is find out what your true intention was. If your true intention was to get out of body so you could avoid the material, then you need to look at two things. One, was there a spirit wanting me to avoid this material? And what emotion inside of me caused me to attract this spirit who wanted to avoid the material? There's usually an emotion, and when I say usually, there's always an emotion attached to the reasons why. The second thing that will happen sometimes when you're reading the pageant messages is sometimes your spirit friends will grab you while you're reading them and take you on a little journey. Sometimes those journeys you will not be able to remember because um, to remember them would, would create huge emotional havoc within yourself. So you have a gap in a period of time that seems to be like an hour or whatever that you can't remember. The key is to go back to the line before and read the line before that, that you could last remember reading and what in it was causing, is, was there anything you wanted to get away out of when you read that line? And this, by the way, applies to any material you read, not just the pageant messages. Is there something you wanted to get out of when you read that line? What was you, were, or was it something you wanted to get into? Because many times there are spirits around you who want to assist you to have more trust in the truth you're receiving. And they will also lead you in, at certain times as well. The key is to trust your feelings and emotions about what is happening. And it will be different for every person. Um, at first I thought I was going into a spirit world and then someone said, no, that's not it, you're just denying your uh, thing. But I really, um, it, it takes me ages to read a page because I reread it and it'll go, all, and it takes about three or four hours sometimes. I'm at 1.30, I'm, it's 1.30 and um, this also happens with prayer. And yeah. uh, I... It hasn't happened once or twice. It's, it's continual it's, event. It's many, many times, and I was trying to work it out myself, but I haven't quite got to really knowing what is happening. Well, what, I, I'm not telling you what's really happening for you. you that's what you want me to do, yeah. and I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is put forward different suggestions to you to experiment with and start trusting what you feel is the truth, not what other people around you feel is the truth. You see, a lot of us, what we're doing is, a lot of us have a feeling, initial feeling, right? Whatever it was, I think it was that. Yeah. And then you come running up to AJ and say, was it that? Was it that? Was it that? And I'm saying, well, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> what do you, why aren't you trusting you? Right? If, if God's got you in her arms, then God can tell you just as easily as God can tell me. So why aren't you trusting you? You need to start trusting you. Now, if you trust you and your life gets worse, then you know that, well, I trusted the wrong thing there, <laughs> right? And you can address it, can't you? Quite easily. You just stop doing that and say, oh, I was off, I, was, I made a mistake. You're allowed to make mistakes on the divine path, aren't you? God doesn't come along with a great big wick, go, you know, <laughs> Libby, you made a mistake, now it's punishment time, you know, like, and God's not like that, right? You will feel it and you can address that issue. You don't need me to help you address that issue. Yeah, yeah maybe the, the fact that you said that sometimes you don't remember, because the feeling, even though I don't remember it, it's like when I'm in my dream state and I'm up and sometimes talking with you and other people, mm -hmm. I, it's the same feeling, and then, but this time, when I'm in this, in my couch actually, mm -hmm. I don't remember anything. I just go in and out and it's not like meditation, it's mm -hmm. not like sleep, it's not, it's none of those. So mm -hmm. I thought, well, what could this be, you know? Mm -hmm. So maybe that's it then. So you need to pray about what this could be. And you need to find out through your own seeking what this will be. And I can guarantee you, you will find it out if you seek hard enough. Just like I've had to find things out by seeking them hard enough. Do you follow me? Now, the reason why you notice that I'm starting to not tell you things now, rather than telling you things, is because many of you are now working through these issues of trust of yourself. Right? Many of you are still trusting too much externally and not starting to trust your own emotions and feelings. Right? And you need to get from this position of trusting someone external to yourself to only trusting God and yourself. Remember we talked about that yesterday, right? 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to back off more and more and more and more and expect you to resolve the issue with your relationship with God. Because this is what it's all about. Not relying on me, not relying on Mary, not relying on anyone else. Relying on your connection with God. That's what this, can, this is all about, right? So that's why I'm doing that with you. I know it might be frustrating sometimes, but uh, that's the way it goes. Nina. <laughs> with um, healing, like sometimes when I'm working on people, they experience a lot of heat yep. coming from my hands, and I can feel that energy, but... Um, I would like to know. I know I don't. I don't know you've been saying work it out for yourself, but is what's actually going on in that process, and how much benefit is there to the person? What I want to do is answer all the questions about the physics of what's going on at, at later at later times when we start talking about the details about the mediumship and the healing. Is that okay? Because that, because what I want to do at the moment is concentrate on the soul condition stuff, and that is more like the physics of what's actually occurring be, between the healer, the spirit who's working through the healer, and the person, what's going on emotionally with the person, what's going on emotionally with the healer, and so forth. And I want to talk about those things as a separate, separate issues. And we'll do some experiments with that so that you can answer many of those questions yourselves even, right? And, and make these experiments. And that will be part of the exercises, the homework exercises for coming for coming presentations. Yep. Right up the back, thanks. If I'm having a chat with God and I get an answer, yep. how do I know whether that is God or if it's a spirit just trying to pretend they're God? You get an answer that you can hear? Sometimes it's just an awareness. Yeah. The way God... I used to say in the first century that God speaks with you, to you, in a still, quiet, silent voice. What I meant by that was that God speaks with you via feelings. Right? That's how God communicates with you soul to soul. So if you're hearing words, somebody is translating those feelings. Now sometimes that somebody can be another spirit who's translating those feelings from God into words and then giving to you, you, them to you as words or it can be another spirit who's creating those words or it can be your own process which is actually a process between the spirit body and the material body that converts feelings into words. So it could be any of those things that are occurring. The key again is to ask yourself what just happened, what just occurred. The truth is that where you'll get to a point in the future where all communication between yourself and God will happen without words. Right? And it will just be feelings, soul to soul feelings. Things will happen so rapidly in that state that it will be like huge packets of information will just hit you and you'll suddenly know something that you just didn't know before. But to describe it to another person, unless they've personally experienced it, is going to be very difficult. Right? But God speaks to you through that kind of method. In the pageant messages we called it and um, speaks to you in silent in silent a silent whisper I think we called it or something like that. Yeah. Is that what you get? Yes, yeah. I don't get words ever. So even when I'm doing a session like this, many mediums when I'm doing a session like this notice that there's a huge uh, column of light coming down into me and many people have described this who can see spirits and see spiritual things the huge column of light coming down to me and then my body just glows and then all of this stuff comes out and that's what happens it's sort of like a packet packets of information that's why I rarely have to think about something and often when I do think about it that means that I am a bit disconnected uh, and when you when you when you get a state where you're completely communicative you'll find you rarely have to think at all. Yeah. Uh, James, thanks. Oh, sorry. You were James first? <laughs> yeah, Mike's with you. So. Uh, just what, what I've been finding recently is that I can get words and then be aware of the feeling that they've risen from, uh, but I'm becoming more aware, that's becoming more synchronous. Than what often happens in this transition for many of you, and this is something that will go on for some time, is as your soul expands in its awareness and its ability to transmit information to other souls, you will have 
this um, uh, there's a bit of ringing so can you just switch that mic off for a moment if it's on yeah and what will happen is that um, the the as your soul receives information the soul's ability to receive information accurately uh, varies quite a lot depending on your condition and the more your condition or your soul expands the, the greater capacity your soul has just to receive information very very clearly in its direct feeling form now every celestial spirit only communicates with others through a language that is based on feelings so, so there is above the eight sphere. So, this, for the eight sphere and above, I'll just turn this down a bit. Something's the eight sphere and above. What's happening is that there's this. Um, now I'm not here, getting heard at all, am I? Am I getting heard now? Yeah. Yes. The eight sphere and above. What's happening is that there's this transmission of language, all happens to with feelings, and there's a universal language in the eight sphere and above. Now, in the spheres below, there are still different languages at different times, but people learn new languages quite easily, quite rapidly. So many of the spirits who come to you, who are going to be in the eighth sphere and above, will be spirits... It's still ringing really badly. Um, it's off. Is the other one off? Yeah. Both mics are off. Hmm. You want it to, is that off? Is this one off? That's off. You can hear it? You're not hearing a ringing? Oh, yeah. down the front there's a ringing. Yeah. No, it's all right now, I think. It's just very off-putting when I'm speaking. <laughs> all right. Well, well, I can still hear it. You reckon it's the spirits that's just started? I'll just turn it down just a tad. And we'll see how we go. Now, um, what, were I, what was I talking about? <laughs> I forgot my... The eighth fear, yes. Um, so let's say, yeah, but the way it works is like this. Um, and I've said this before, but it's something to remember. Here's your soul. Here's the soul of the spirit is connecting with you, right? Now, if this spirit's in the eighth sphere, what the spirit will be wanting to do eventually is just communicate you with you soul to soul. Remember your soul is your emotions, your passions, your desires, your longings, right? So the, the soul of the spirit will be able to just communicate large packets of information in bursts. Uh, there's electronic analogies I could use, but most of that would lose you anyway. But um, there's bursts or packets of information that we could just be given instantaneously through this connection. Now, what happens normally is our soul has to communicate with the mind of the spirit body, which communicates and uses the brain of the material body, which then translates into the... There's a translation process that goes into there, into words or speech, which then is sound-waved into the brain through the ear of the, ex, of the receiver, right? And then that goes down into the mind of the spirit body, which then goes down into the soul, right? Now, do you think that's a long-winded process? Yeah. yeah. And that's what we, how we communicate now on Earth. It's a very ineffectual method of communication because, to be honest, I can say a word which has no negative connotation to me whatsoever and you can hear it very negatively through your emotional filters, through this process. So I can say the word God and half the audience walks out. Right? That has happened at times right so why because there is a heap of negative connotations that these people have towards God because they have a relationship between God and religion religion and oppression and off they go right and you say the word God and all of a sudden there's all these emotions percolating up inside of a person very ineffectual method of actually knowing how I feel you don't know how I feel unless you feel what I feel can you see that all right, now what, what a celestial spirit does is it, it doesn't want to communicate this way. It has to with you for, for the moment maybe, but it doesn't want to. What it wants to do and what it's teaching you to do is to communicate that way. It's a lot faster, a lot more effective. They can communicate large packets of information to large numbers of people without having to be present. And it's a very effective way because you can feel their emotions. So you know exactly what they felt as well. 
and all these pictures come flooding into your mind and all and this is where people get into inspiration you know and all of a sudden you, you see this happening constantly by the way you see artists get this inspiration and bang out they go and away they go like, madly and draw as far as they possibly can because they just got a packet of information right you often see it with musicians writing music or writing um, even the words to music. You often see this inspiration come because there's soul-to-soul -soul communication going on. Now, spirits in the higher spheres use only soul-to-soul -soul communication. In the, when they're talking to people in the lower spheres, then they've got to use words and other things. So what the spirits are trying to teach you to do is how to become this way in the methods of communicating. And that will slowly be increasing as you develop your soul condition. When you get into an at-one-minute condition, this is how you will be communicating with every single being around you. Right? And you may say words, but this communication will eventually be the thing that actually makes things change. Right? But you can still get it wrong, can't you? Because it's still got to come in through your emotional filters. Yeah, and the only time you're not going to get it wrong is when you're in the eighth sphere or above. Or to be more accurate, the only time you're not going to get it wrong is when you are in exactly the same condition or a better condition than the spirit or person who is speaking with you. Right? And this applies to people on earth as well as in the spirit world. So, and I'm talking about condition of love, soul condition. So let's say, let's say I'm in the eighth sphere, I've just entered the eighth sphere, and there's a spirit who's in the 21st sphere talking to me. Now, if I've never been in the 21st sphere before, and I'm just in the eighth sphere, what's going to happen? I'll be able to receive a lot of their information, but I'm still not going to be able to feel all of their emotion because they are in a much higher capacity of love than what I am. And so I'm not going to feel the full extent of their emotion, but I'll receive a lot of the information. Now, let's say I'm that spirit in the eighth sphere, and I'm, or a person on earth in the eighth sphere, and I'm talking to a person in the first sphere. Now, because of my capacity of love, I have a much greater capacity to be sensitive to the emotion and I will be able to feel even the emotions that that person cannot feel within themselves. Right. So many of you often I come along and say to you, you've got this emotion. They say, no, I haven't. And then a year later you find out you have. How did that happen? It was because I can feel that you have that emotion and you will feel this. You will feel it with every interaction around you. This will happen. So, Everything will become like a soul-to-soul -soul interaction. And in fact, soul-to-soul -soul interactions are the only true interactions. From God's perspective, they're the only real interactions. Every interaction you have with somebody is purely pointless. And on the divine love path, have you noticed, for those of you who are dealing with your emotions, have you noticed how difficult it is now to connect to a person who's just intellectual? Yes. yes. Isn't it difficult? The reason why is you're getting this barrage of intellect and their emotion doesn't match it. And you think, well, what's going on? This doesn't feel right. You know, they were getting different feelings from it. Like, you know, and initially when you start feeling this, you go through all this confusion. What am I getting wrong? You know, like, this all seems strange. But actually what's going on is this really lovely thing and that is you are now starting to be sensitive to their emotion that they are denying. And now when they don't speak what they feel, you feel a falsity. You feel, I'm not getting to know this real person. I'm getting to know some, like, oh, who am I getting to know? This brain. This brain that's got lots of language and words coming out of it, right? But, but what's happening is not, I, I'm not having an, a relationship with it. I can't have a relationship with their brain. I have a relationship with their soul, right? And this is the trouble with words, is words have a large, large impact in the sense that we can easily misinterpret them. There was this uh, thing I read today that said that words have meanings. I'm sorry. Words have zero, zero, zero meanings. Like, honestly. <coughs> it's the emotion the word creates or connects to inside of you that has the meaning. All right? That's the thing that creates the meanings. So... You know, you can swear all your life, but if you have no emotion attached with it, it means nothing. 
And how many times do you swear and have no emotion attached to it? <laughs> right? Yeah. So, so you see, we use certain words be, not because the words have a power, but, but because the emotion has the power and it's expressed excellently via that word. Does that make sense? It's always the emotion that has this power. This is why it's so important to actually focus on the emotion in your interaction with others. So you notice, many of you have noticed that if you're very intellectual interactions with me, I feel less inclined to speak with you. You notice that? When you connect emotionally with me, I love your company. Right? Because when it's an intellectual thing, I'm not getting the real you. I'm getting this thing that you think you are not what you really are. And it's the same with God, right? When you're connecting with God or I'm connecting with God, it's the same. If, if it's just a heap of words without any, mean, without any feeling, what's God getting? Just your brain rattling off a heap of words. Nothing else. Like not getting any of you, any of your emotion. And this is why oftentimes you see very, very angry people who are religious, right? trying to connect to God but not really being able to because they're really, really very angry inside of themselves with God but they don't want to say to God, you know, yell and swear at God, right? Because they're so afraid that God might smite them or something, right? So they don't want to say, yell and swear at God but they really feel that in their heart. God knows their feelings. God knows your feelings. This is where we all need to be truthful with each other. We need to be truthful about what we feel. And so you'll find myself and Mary. Um, Mary's now flicked into this gear of wanting to have your babe, but flicked into this gear of wanting to be very truthful with everyone. And and you'll find that both of us are being a lot more truthful with you in our interactions emotionally. Now, getting back to the subject of the meanership, though, the reason why this is very important is because at the end we want to be sensitive to every single person's emotions around us and our own but not act upon them. You see, if, if I'm sensitive to your emotion and your emotion says, oh, please, pretty please, AJ, give me approval, give me approval, that's the emotion that I'm feeling from you, what's my, if I'm loving to you, what's my going to be my response? I'm not going to give you any of my approval <laughs> so that you can actually work through that emotion. Does that make sense? Now, if I'm, if I'm interacting with you on an intellectual level, I would probably, you know, you want my I'll probably give you some. Does that make sense? Without being notice of, without noticing what's going on inside of, or underneath. Now you will notice this a lot of times in your interactions with others, but you, and oftentimes you're already aware without noticing. Now, by what I mean by that is, you might walk up to a person in the street and all of a sudden just feel a bad, bad vibe, right? What's happening? Well, what's happening is they're projecting an emotion at you that you don't want to return. That's what's happening. That's, and it's triggering something inside of you as well that you do need to feel. But there's, but there's something you don't want to return. They're wanting something from you emotionally. They haven't even opened their mouth. They're wanting something from you emotionally that you are not prepared to give, whatever that thing is. And you know that's what creates most dislike? Just that one simple thing. One person wants something from the other person that the other person is not willing to give. And you know what creates most like? One person wants something that the other person's willing to give. <laughs> Mary? Can I just relate that to spirits? Because sure. a lot of people um, feel really good about their mediumship because the spirits that are visiting them are giving them a sense of feeling important or feeling knowledgeable or mm. feeling special. Or um, So it's exactly what you said that occurs with people occurs with spirits yep. to a greater degree yep. because there's not someone actually there physically in front of you that you can uh, that you can see what's going on and spirits can very clearly see your emotional injuries yep. and so they can manipulate them very quickly and subtly in a way that you're not aware of exactly so like a person can come along and I as a spirit I'm looking at the person I go hmm they want their back patted you know I just pat their back and I'll get whatever I want out of them. This happens all the time, right? Or I stroke their ego, as the saying goes, and I'll get what I want out of them. You've got to remember that there are many spirits, when they see your spirit body, you, you know the only thing they see is your injuries. That's all they see. And when they see their, your injuries, 
what they do is they see it not from the point of view of helping you, but from the point of view of, hmm, injury. I can use that. Hmm, injury. I can use that. That's how they see you. They don't even see you as a person a lot of times. They see you just as a bowl of injuries that they can manipulate and use however they want, whenever they want. Right? The reason why is every injury inside of you has a certain colour and a certain condition in your spirit body and a certain location. And they can just notice those things. So every alcoholic on this planet who's, who's earthbound on this planet knows when a person, the, the, the kind of condition inside of a person they can use to help them become an alcoholic. Right? They just look for it. Mm, there's one. Mm, there's one. You know, that, that was like... And, they sca- and, and of course, it's easier frequenting certain locations. So I go to the pub, there's going to be more of those ones than if I go to, like, you know, a group like this, perhaps. Does that make sense? So what will they do? They'll frequent the pub instead of frequenting a group like this, in many cases. But that's how the spirits look upon these events. Now... That all being said, what I'd like to do now is, and we have, we've only got about an hour left, or is it an hour left? Yeah. Less than. Less than. And what I would like to do now is actually look at your homework from last time. How did you go with your homework? Who did their homework? Be honest. All right, only a few. All right. Boy, there's not going to be many at our next meeting. <laughs> all right. So, um, what I would like to do, do you mind, Anna, if I read out yours? Is that all right? You don't want to come up, do you? So, is it all right if I read it out? Yeah, you do want to come up. Awesome. You don't, want to, well, you don't have to if you don't want to. I'm happy to read it out. You'll go through your fear. Awesome. I'm impressed. <laughs> do you want to read what you sent to me? No. <laughs> this is embarrassing, Anna said. Yeah, we'll get you to speak in the microphone so everybody can hear that you're embarrassed. <laughs> now, Anna is one of those who did do her homework. And, uh, and in a quite an interesting way. And remember what your homework was, by the way? Remember all those terrible things that were said about me? And uh, I gave you a list of all the terrible things that everyone would be saying about me and gave you a few websites to have a look at. And a lot more terrible things came up on those websites uh, as well over the period of two months, which actually worked very well for you. Right? And what you could do is actually connect with all of those feelings and then start to feel some of these doubts that you feel about me. Right? So the beauty of doing this, if you did it, is that you would be starting to connect to your fears and doubts. And fears and doubts hugely affect your mediumship and your healing skills. And this is what we want to illustrate. (laughs) And it's from um, from, uh, uh, Mullumbimby, which is near Brian Bray, isn't it, basically? All right, so, um, and uh, how long ago did you first come against the teachings that I've been teaching? A year ago. A year ago. So you've been listening to quite, you've come to quite a few groups. Almost most of all you, of them, yeah. Yeah, most of you would recognise. And, um, and during that time you've had a lot of your belief systems confronted, haven't you? Particularly all my spiritual belief systems. Okay, yep. so what kind yeah. of belief systems were confronted in that time? Um, well, I had a lot of comparison of you with other teachers that yep. I've been with that I felt a greater depth of um, experience in myself yep. and I wasn't getting that from you. Yep. And um, so that was a, a, a reason why I couldn't um, say who you were. Yep. Um, I can't, what else? So, so do you now from our discussion today sort of understand that they were just giving you some emotions that you needed to feel validated and in giving you that emotion, you felt, oh, this is my validation. Can you see that's what actually was occurring? I don't know if it was giving me validation, but it gave me something that I wanted. That yeah, it gave you an emotion, an, like a, a pleasant feeling emotion. Where it was a spiritual state yes. that, I, that I was looking for. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I'm not giving you that, am I? Not at all. You no. never did. No. And I'm giving you instead quite a lot of trauma. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah. Most people find that, eh? <laughs> um, 
what, what was really lovely about what Anna did was that um, she wrote to me a sum total of her experiment that she did over the last, over the last two months and put it in a very concise form, actually, I thought. So you don't need to be embarrassed about this at all. It's very concise and, and, it, and it consists of a message that was written from what she believed was myself, about myself, and then a message that was written by another spirit after she went through it, through a heap of doubts and fears and everything about myself. So that's basically a summary of what happened, isn't it? So before we began this particular experiment, you basically had pretty, you've still, and still got a little of, doubts about my personal identity. Would that be right? I think less now, but a yeah, lot bef less now. before, um, yeah. I, it was like going like this. Sometimes, sometimes I, do. I do, and sometimes, sometimes I, I didn't. And that's, then you'd say something or do something, and I, yeah, it's right. no, it can't be. Yeah. He'd <laughs> say know? something like, and, yeah. what kind of things would would say, no, he couldn't be? I, I can't think of anything at the moment, but... Yeah. And I, I'd be really scrutinising you from, yep. from my past experiences. Yeah. And, and there'd be one thing, and I'd go, no, no. Yeah. Couldn't. Write him off, then. But no, not, not, <laughs> not to not that degree. Because you've really stuck it out, even though you've had these doubts, haven't you? You're like, you've been interested in the information. Well, the first time I looked at your, your video, and I just saw your, your physical form, I just knew. But, but that was before my... Doubts crept in. Def yeah. 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 Now, many of you have had the same experience. And the reason why is that when you first met me, your spirit guide confirmed to you what I'm saying. But then what your spirit guide does is step back and says, now you've got to sort it out for yourself whether he's what he's saying or not, you see? And so many of you initially get that initial feeling, wow, yeah, you go home all enthusiastic, and then the next day it's like, hmm or in the next week or the next month, or I say something usually that, that actually triggers an emotion, like a belief system that you really hold dear to your heart, and all of a sudden that gets triggered, and well, now, now, now it might not be true, right? And then I say a lot of very, very nice things that you like to hear, you tickle your ear, and, and it sounds real good, and then I say another thing, there I stick my foot up, and, <laughs> and away it goes again, right? And this is what happens usually in a cycle. And usually, when I get to the point of saying one too many things that trigger a person, that's when they leave <laughs> and they never see me again. And what I've admired with yourself is you've, I've felt the critical analysis mm -hmm. coming from yourself, but admired that you still keep coming and allowing the truth to sit with you and work its way through your doubt, which is really wonderful. So, do you mind if I read this or do you want to read this? No, you're good. no okay. You don't have to start here for that if you want, don't want. <laughs> awesome, you're going to do with the fear. Awesome, I like this. <laughs> this is taking some courage for me to write to you, which it was, wasn't it? Yeah. After uh, the and I didn't mean to hit the send button. That was an accident. Oh, yeah. One thing that happened in all of this is she wrote this letter out to me, two pages, not intending to send it. <laughs> but you, when you do that, you've got to not put the address on the top. <laughs> Just a trick I've learnt, right? <laughs> it was offline. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway. After the last mediumship weekend, I've been obsessed with looking what is within me that stops me from accepting you as Jesus. First I read the negative emails, but they did nothing, as I could see they were only others' projections and, fe and fear, etc. How many of you felt that about all those things that were said? Okay, so, sorry that it didn't help you, I tried my best. <laughs> First, I read the negative emails, uh, sorry, uh, I could see that where I had no doubt about your teachings, I was still kind of put the AJ Jesus thing on the back burner. I wanted to look at my doubt, so I did my first channeling. AJ, I don't really know if I'm channeling my own mind, but this night I decided to ask Jesus if he was you. And this is what I wrote. <laughs> At this time, doubt was uppermost. Jesus said, I am sending you to AJ. He is not me, yet strongly connected to me in a way you and no one can as yet understand. There is work to be done and a purpose to this whole theatre of divine. Don't be revealed in time. AJ needs to think he is me, or he would never be able to deliver my messages and teachings in the way that he does. Don't shoot the messenger. Keep trusting your own process, and I'll always be here by your side to guide you as I've always been. 
Yes, his teachings are true, and the truth, uh, and the truth, and he has also more to unfold in himself. He is trustworthy in his heart. You are called to be with AJ for the great healing of the terrible misinformation created on the earth around my teachings for the last 2,000 years. This you elected to do a long time ago and chose to be one of those people on earth because of your love of truth that was there since you were a young girl. Your life has been difficult because you were being prepared for this time. You could never fit into the status quo or you would never have come here to partake of this renaissance of spirit. This has always and ever been your calling only when you wanted it to look another way. AJ is having these memories so that you can feel my life through him. The things that need to be straightened out on earth can only happen this way. In that sense we are one, but not the way you think or the way it may appear. There is good purpose in all this, that is the essential to know. The truth about the spirit world is as true as it can be and it too is rapidly changing and unfolding in the midst of this great divine plan. We are all servants in the hands of the divine even when we too play our part in this regard and do not know the outcome. Holding you in all my heart with greatest love, Jesus. All right. That was the doubtful one. That was the doubtful one. All right. So basically, um, I've had a lot of these emails, by the way, <laughs> over the last five years, as you can imagine, where people have told me that I need to think that I'm Jesus in order to whatever. And uh, to be frank with you, um, if they knew the emotional processes that I'd been going through, <laughs> they would definitely um, n know that I don't have to think I'm Jesus, that's for sure. And in fact, I've tried to avoid that for a long time. So... Um, the truth is that there is some truth in there, obviously. Um, and, but what was beautiful in the way that you wrote it is you wrote it exactly as you felt, as you felt at that time, and I really loved that. That was good. And then she says, cringe, cringe. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't want to hide from you, and that's what you asked us to do. Then I watched the denial of the soul, and I was so touched by you and Cornelius when you said you were just an ordinary man, Jesus. It struck me so deeply, and it made so much sense. I saw I had my own picture and sort of private relationship with Jesus and he felt gentler than you. He was always there for me any time I wanted to call on him and chat and he was not a knock or Aussie. <laughs> well, that's true, but for nearly 2,000 years I wasn't a knock or Aussie. I was a Jewish Jew. <laughs> I was always left in profound states and depths of my being as well as, as well as my horrible dark stuff being revealed. Whenever I left your meetings, I never felt deeper in myself and I compared you with, with John and my times in India where I had very deep states of silence and presence. So I felt like your words were not entering me or having a deep effect on me and so my mind kept comparing it with past experiences and all that crying. I kept trying to marry what I've marry what I have journeyed through with other teachers but it was useless and only confusing to the point of nauseating. Every time I would try to do that, the intense waves of unbearable heat would course through my body and I'd have to completely stop. So last weekend I listened to your fear is the friend, is your friend. And I actually heard you saying just that, how we hear your words and love the content but they're not entering our souls. I know this to be true. Nevertheless, every time there was a meeting, I would do everything in my power to be there. Which is very true. You have done that, haven't you? Yeah. Also, for many months, I did not talk about where I was going much or about you until I felt a deep trust in myself that it was working and true. Also, the Jesus bit. In other words, also, the Jesus bit was another reason for not telling anybody. Right? And many of you feel the same, right? Yeah. yeah. Then... Now I am circulating your DVDs and having small groups where we help each other go deeper into our feelings and this feels like all I want to spend my time doing. Am I obsessed? <laughs> Certainly you are, darling. That's really good. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, you've got to get obsessed with God. That's the way it goes. And one last fact. As a kid, I saw right through the phony, pious, religious stuff we were fed and I had no interest in Christianity at all. The only thing I felt was that Jesus must have been a special person somewhere. I had a really unhappy home and a deep quest to find the purpose of why I was here, not just to get married and have kids, which I could see was a miserable place from my parents' reflection. 
<laughs> doesn't have to be there anymore, does it? Like, no. Yeah. Do you want me to read the next paragraph? You're okay with that? So I took LSD when I was 19, acting deeply for the purpose of my life to be revealed, asking deeply for the purpose of my life to be revealed to me. Amazing that. Drugs really help, right? <laughs> and in the middle of it, God came to me in my heart and soul in golden light and love like I've never felt before or since. Something in me was completely transformed and I knew I was a child of God and that he loved me and was always with me. At work after that, I saw right through everybody as I was seeing into their souls. I wondered why they put on so many funny coverings. But I was young and I didn't understand and I tried to shut it all down and not look at people because I felt I was invading their privacy by, not seeing, by seeing into them. I prayed to God at that night to show me the way to find this without the need of a drug-induced state. And that led me to following Eastern masters and teachings for the next 30 years. I'm getting off track, anyway. Last night, I watched The Passion. I was horrified. It was if, it was, it's as if it was you in the picture, carrying that awful wooden cross, being so tortured, and those ignorant Roman soldiers and fearful priests. I could not separate you from Jesus, and it cut me to the core and made me feel so much. I don't have the words for it, just feeling that this is what AJ has had to live through, remember and feel. Somewhere in watching that movie, you and Jesus have fused inside me, and there is only one. I don't know what has happened, but I feel like my heart is on fire when I think about you. There is so much passion and feeling, and I've felt dead for so long. I pray the fire keeps burning and opening me up. And also, that if in my doubt I've not put good things out, <laughs> please forgive me. And it is from my deep mistrust of anyone outside of me being real and true. I've always had to do it all alone. So this morning I asked God to send me the highest level spirit guide that I could receive. I felt the most delicate, soft, loving, feminine presence come down. The name was Mary, in questions I think. Just know she felt very angelic and this came. But it was hard to me stay tuned with the presence because it was so much higher than me, but I did my best. Beloved one, she says, you have moved much since the last message you wrote about AJ and Jesus and have allowed yourself to process much of your beliefs, feelings and fears about your blockages to believing AJ when he says who he is. You can now see that AJ Jesus is just an ordinary man like yourself, a child of God, yet a most beloved child of God in his love, willingness and humility to face and walk his talk in every way and in every moment. You have also seen and been shown the terrible damage done by the false teachings and indoctrinations of the so-called Christian religions. Hence, you have also seen the massive need for truth to be shown here on earth to clean up this terrible misinformation, mess and false believing. In your own heart now, you can see that to receive divine love into your heart is the single most important and powerful thing you or anyone can ever do on this earth plane. All that AJ Jesus is doing here is to show you this and at the same time by showing you the true teachings of Jesus and his life, he is demystifying and de-deifying Jesus to you and to others who open their hearts and souls to this truth. Keep ever opening your heart and soul to hearing, receiving and applying these truths and the joy of living in alignment from your heart to the passion of AJ Jesus will only and ever serve you in your continued opening to receiving God's love and truth. In peace and love, Mary. It was not easy to stay connected with that so lovely presence and probably I filled in with my words but the energy of the whole thing I know was there. Dear AJ, this all feels very exposing for me. Please feel free to shoot me down. There is no time to waste. There is so much gratitude in my heart to you and Mary and Cornelius and I have not met the others for the courage, love and dedication that I see and feel in all of you. P.S. The other big issue for me to was the reincarnation one and that took me months to get through that one. I pray I keep on walking toward, forwards and upwards and will have the courage to keep facing the truth and my own arrogance. Always and only wanted, hev always and only wanted heaven on earth. Love to you and Mary and a prayer. Isn't it lovely? Thanks so much. So that was fairly interesting sort of process for you, wasn't it? 
And in the process of watching the passion and, and dealing with a lot of those other doubts and fears that you had, a lot of things got released in the process, which was really powerful. And, uh, and that's a part of this process, is releasing, releasing the emotions. Now, did any others have a similar sort of experience to that that you'd like to out outline? You want a microphone, Lisa? Thanks. Um, yeah, mine's not quite similar, but, and I felt a bit guilty that I hadn't done my homework. And, but, AJ, when I first came to the first meeting last year in June, I think, and um, I very naively put up my hand, I don't know if you remember, and said, look, I don't believe you, Jesus. And I don't know why, I just thought you could handle that. Yeah, yeah, I did. And, um, <laughs> and you know, and then I came the next day. And um, I forget a lot of things, but I really remember the next day. And I think it was about two hours into the session. And you stood there and you had tears coming down your face. And you said, I've got the most terrible backache. And so many of you are projecting to me that you don't believe who I am. And, and your face was just grieving and um, you know, my, maybe I'm projecting and um, you said I re really what I want to do is just walk out of here and go home yeah. um, and from that moment you know my heart just I don't know I just sort of had this expansion um, that from that second I just sort of really I mean you know you can tell me if I'm full of bullshit but <laughs> um, I just sort of thought oh my God, you know, this man, you know, you, you are so full of integrity and so honest. I've, I've had projected at me all my life, you know, bullshit and people saying one thing and projecting another. And, yeah. and I just knew in my being that there was just total honesty coming from you in that moment. And yeah. from that second, I, I just, you know, I receive, well, this is what I feel. I feel I receive what you say and who you are in my heart and soul, like my intellect, you know, I had a bit of trouble with reincarnation, but I've let that grow. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I feel that I, I, I d haven't had any doubts from that second day. I yeah. mean, you can tell me now if I have. <laughs> um, but, you know, and all of us coming, you know, we're spending our time and money and transport. Why would we be here unless there's just this devotion to your message? And, and you know, your modeling, you know, I. I think you're the first person I've ever trusted in my life, you know. Um, yeah. I mean, again, I could be full of bullshit, but do you know what I mean? I feel, yeah. yeah, it's really deep for me. I have a real passion for you and the message. And yeah, thanks, Louie. Yeah. The, the, um, a, a lot of people have expressed the same thing, of course, and, and the, the truth is the more real myself and Mary and all of the others of the 14 are, the more you'll actually feel our emotions and our memories and you'll have more and more feelings of conviction as time goes along. The, the truth is too, that though, that we don't expect everyone to believe us, but I do, I'm really passionate about the message, as you know, and so the key is, is if you can have an open enough mind just to hear the message, that can help a lot. But the reason why I raised this for the mediumship sessions was that doubt, what I wanted to do is illustrate, and I think Anna's uh, two channelings illustrate the difference of what happens when doubt and fear is involved in a channeling. Right? So in that first channeling, you thought you were channeling myself, saying quite a number of things to you, and, and, yet, and yet quite a number of those things were reflected in through your own beliefs. And I, am, I could actually go through and list all of these beliefs uh, as well as to how they were affecting you. In the second channeling, you had worked through quite a lot of fear and doubt about me as a person and trust of me and so forth. And one of the emotions that has been coming from you from a long, for a long time is this really critical analysis. Like, if I scratch myself here, then, then, you know, that kind of thing. No, I don't mean that. But, the, uh, you know, you scratch yourself and somebody notices that, oh, they wouldn't have done that sort of thing. And, and that there's this strong critical analysis. And, by the way, many of you have had this, so you don't laugh at that. <laughs> and... The strong critical analysis uh, coming um, has, you've also been able to stay at least open enough emotionally to, to receive the truths and get to the point where you're willing to actually feel the emotions, 
uh, inside of yourself and that's what I loved about your second your, your period in between was what I enjoyed the fact that you worked through all of these fears and doubts you compared all these different feelings that you were getting from me compared to the feelings you're getting from other the gurus that if you like if we can call them that that you'd been following and not understanding why those emotions were coming from those people or from the spirits with those people and and still went through the whole process and work your way through quite a lot of emotions and that's the beauty of the divine love path is that if you allow yourself to have your doubts but you work through your emotions work through your emotions it's only by working through your emotions that the truth will become a certainty for you that's the only time and this the right I'm trying to illustrate this is because I know many of you have doubts about me so it was an easy subject to pick on right but there are doubts you have about other things too. Doubts you have about God, for example. Right? You can deal with them exactly the same way that you've dealt with these doubts with me. Right? By actually reflecting <coughs> upon them, dealing with them, going into the doubts, not trying to ignore them. You see, most of the time what we try to do is we want to feel good. Right? Doubts don't feel good, do they? You know, when you're doubting, or when you're in, you know, what do you get? You know, you think about it again and you don't resolve it and then the next day the same issue comes along and it's not resolved again and after a month of that what are you starting to feel then you're starting to feel, oh, I give up on that issue try to just ignore that and then a month later it all comes up again and then somebody you tell oh you're going along to one of these sessions yeah the guy thinks he's Jesus what what like you're going to wear some cult now you never told me this and you know and then all your doubts come up again oh maybe I'm in a cult I don't know you know and, and so you know the, the doubts just keep coming up you notice that? Whenever you have doubts, they're just up again, up again, up again. They're like this jack in a box, right? They're just get bouncing around or bouncing around inside of yourself, coming up all the time. This is how it is inside of us with a doubt. Doubts are tor torturous, I feel. They are so hard to resolve. What I've found myself in terms of dealing with them is that you need to go into them completely and fully experience them. When you go into them and fully experience them, you find that most of your doubts are related to emotions. Emotions of where you've been harmed or hurt in the past. Right? Where you can't be open to trust, open to feelings from God and so forth because of what's happened in the past. So almost every single person who's ever projected at me their doubts and their fears, and a lot have been anger and rage, have all come from what's happened to them in the past being imposed upon my relationship with them because I personally have never treated them in the way that they're actually describing but someone in the past obviously has and something I've said or whatever has triggered that and wham they're in that emotion and off they go now if you can deal with that emotionally you will become such a good medium or healer that you'll be able to be so sensitive to the people with you and the people with the people you're helping that you'll be able to help every single person who comes to you. Every single person. And the only people that you will find difficult to help, although you'll still be able to help them, is the people with, the, with terrible feelings of resistance. But you can even help them, you know, because what you'll do is you'll be in truth and you'll say, I'm feeling from you a wall of resistance. And you know, when you just say that to somebody, it's spoken the truth to them. And they will probably then feel this feeling pass through them. Wow, maybe that is true, right? And that just opens them up as well. So every single person who comes to you will be able to be helped in some way. Even if it's just that smidge of realization that, oh, well, I've got this wall up around me or whatever it is, this wall towards their own emotion or whatever it is. So that's the beauty of becoming sensitive emotionally. And that's why I wanted you to go through this exercise. And what I'm going to suggest to you with this particular exercise that we've just done, you did it about, those of you who have done it, have done it with your issues with me. Well, now what I'm going to suggest is you do with the same thing with your issues with God your same thing with the issues with the divine truth, the same thing with the issues of the different laws that you're hearing about, you know, let your doubts and fears come up. And do the same thing with all of those things that you were afraid of in your past. 
the people you're afraid of in your past the events you've been afraid of in your past because in these fears underneath are all these childhood capping these childhood emotions that are preventing your relationship with God right. now if you can do that you'll find your mediumship abilities will gr grow exponentially now many of you have been reading the pageant messages yes in your reading of them do you find that you can see have you read them chronologically okay so for some of you if you read them chronologically you'll find a, a pattern emerging and the pattern is that right at the start Ned or Mr. Paget had lots of doubts he started off with lots of doubts he was a Christian Baptist background he was a lawyer very intellectual right his wife had just passed he had lots of doubts and then as the different spirits came to him and he started praying and longing for divine love and truth enter him he then went through a very hard period it was the period of time when his child Nita died she was 18 years of age and she died from complications due to an operation and at that point in time he decided that all of the spirits surrounding him were just devils that's what he decided and he went through a rare, very dark period of a few weeks emotionally. And many of you are going to have to go through a dark period like that emotionally in order to experience your doubts and your fears completely. When he came out of it, his communication was so good that we could start channeling some really good high-level divine truths to him through the mediumship, through the method of mediumship or prophecy. <coughs> So my suggestion is if you get rid of a lot of your doubts and your fears you will find that your mediumship will improve so much. Now if you get rid of doubts and fears then you're in this state where you're open to everything coming to you. And when you're open to everything coming to you and if you're sensitive with our next discussion which is about the emotional sensitivity really that's what we're talking about that's what we're trying to work on sensitivity sensitivity um, <coughs> oh, by the way one of the main things that a lot of people are saying that I can't be Jesus about <laughs> is, that, <laughs> is that my spelling and grammar is shocking <laughs> but anyway um, the emotional sensitivity is the next thing that we need to develop when we are emotionally sensitive and open then we can fully feel everything around us and feel all the spirit and you know you will have spirits attracted to you in that state who you can help greatly and the reason why they'll be attracted to you is because they'll feel your love coming out of you when you're emotionally sensitive they'll feel your concern for them so instead of it being just some sort of intellectual operation now where you're helping somebody it becomes a really emotive process where you're helping them something that's very emotional for you and for them now there's a few recordings that I have um, transcribed that have been transcribed by others I should say uh, of me interrelating through a medium to us to spirits in the spirit world that can demonstrate this and what we'll be doing over the coming months is sending some of those out to you to show you what kind of interactions you can start having and then what we're going to do is with some of you who feel confident with your mediumship where you can connect reliably with the spirit what we're going to do is ask you to come up the front and we'll actually do a demonstration of connecting to some spirits um, who are either in some dark places or light places who want to come and talk or ask questions and we'll work through the emotional issues and then we'll try to ask you as an audience what emotions you felt from those spirits does that make sense so that you can start connecting to how to assist them now the ones that are in higher condition obviously they are going to have a whole different groups of emotions for many of you it's so difficult for you to connect to some of these higher spirits because the condition of love they're in you would just be blown away by it like they're full if they're full energy there is not a single person currently on earth who is able to receive the full emotional energy of a of a spirit 
in the eighth sphere. Right? Because actually any person who did would die from the experience. It is so emotionally overwhelming. But that's the capacity to which you're headed. And to do that, you need to become very emotionally sensitive. But on top of being emotionally sensitive, you need to have released a lot of the emotions that would cause you to be overwhelmed by the sensitivity. Can you see that? And that's where we're headed with this process. We want to become more and more and more and more sensitive. Does that make sense with everyone? Yep. Is there any questions about that process? These things. Um, if, like, we're heading towards being at one with God, and so we will be in the eighth sphere. Mm -hmm. So, people connecting with us, then, you know, you just said that they wouldn't be able to handle that. So, mm -hmm. can you explain that to me? Please? What will happen is every person you connect with, you will only connect with in a way that. It, that will, that will be able to assist them emotionally. When you live on the earth plane, it's a little different in the way that your bodies interact. You, it, when you're in the spirit state, when you come down a sphere in the spirit state, the way God's created it is you have to also come down in the reflection of the love state that you have to a degree so that you don't harm the people in that state. Does that make sense? There's a description of it actually in the um, Robert James Lee's material where it, you actually come down, he says it comes down into a neutral state. And, when, and this is something that happens fully. You come down into this neutral state. So it, all, what you are getting from me at the moment is me in a very neutral state. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and you will only ever be able to experience myself or Mary in our full state if you are in the 22nd sphere of the spirit world. Right? Now, as my state of reflection of my own emotional injuries changes, my full state will change and you will feel those changes. And when I become at one with God, you will feel a lot of changes there. And when there's a soul union between myself and Mary, you will also feel a lot of changes after that process occurs. You follow me? But because we will need to exist in a detuned state for the majority of people, you won't see it in its full state until you get into that state yourself. Right? And that's the beauty of all progression too, is that, and, and this is something to bear in mind generally too, with your, I don't know where my, oh, there it is, and um, something to bear in mind too with all of your progression, is that here's the spheres of the spirit world, right? And so forth. Now, if I am here in the third sphere, let's say, doesn't matter whether I'm on earth or not. I am going to be very emotionally sensitive to any person who's below that sphere in their, in their love state. Does that make sense? And I'm also going to be quite, I'm going to be the best sensitive to the people who are in the same state as myself. You can see that? But you can see that it's going to be very hard for me to understand the states of the people that are in a better love state than I am. And this is something to remember in all of your progression, that it's going to be very difficult. In fact, just one person, one sphere above me in progression, projecting love at me is going to feel so overwhelming that I'm going to not know whether they're there or here unless I can feel them in a lot of different ways, feel their belief systems and feel the love coming from them and feel... And this is why a lot of people misinterpret spirits with them. You see, there's a lot of spirits in the sixth sphere in particular who believe themselves to be at one with God, and they are not. But their love state compared with people here on earth, which are down in this first or early second sphere state, is so much greater that all of you would feel them as a divine presence. Right? And this is why there's so much misinterpretation of what makes up an angel. Yep, question? Up the back there. If we, um, if we could have a mic up the back there. That's it. Do you have to get up through all of them before you get to heaven? Um, this, the first seven spheres of... Or, these are all dimensional existences. 
But what I would call heaven is the eighth sphere of moon above. Right? Or in the first century, I called it the kingdom of God. And in the first century, I called this area the kingdom of man. These spheres are transitional spheres. The spheres that are from first to the seventh are bringing you to God. How do you know which one you're on? It doesn't matter really when you're on earth. And even in the spirit world, it really doesn't matter. Right? The key thing that matters is whether you're progressing in love or not. And, it, and what it is is the reflection of the love that you have in your soul. That, that is the thing that matters anyway, really. Alex, can we have the mic over with Alex? <coughs> <laughs> We're just triggering each other all day. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> poor, poor, poor Ian's in the middle and he doesn't know what to do. Um, we, as you progress th through those higher spheres, yep. do you have a... Like here we have a life where we're born and then we die in order to go to a next fee. Is it like that? Is there an actual life or is it just as you progress you go higher and higher? You can progress through these spheres when you're on earth. So your soul gets into new conditions and you can actually pass, when you're on earth, you can pass into the sixth or seventh or eighth sphere if you want to. In the first century I passed into the tenth sphere. All right. So you can develop on earth to the point and pass directly into one of these locations when you pass. And when you're in your sleep state, you spend the most of your time in the sphere of your own development. So if you're progressing on, the fir if you're progressing on earth and you progress to the third sphere, right, then when you go into the spirit world, you'll spend a lot of your time in the third sphere and or below. And that's what happens every night. Now, in terms of... Sorry? No, no, you're right. I just said <laughs> um, so, so in terms of your progression, you can do this while you're on earth. You don't have to die to do it. But there's another part to your question. When a person in the spirit world makes the transition from, say, the first sphere into the second sphere, the people in the first sphere see it as a death. All right? The person who has the transition doesn't see it as one, but the per often the person in the first sphere, they see a disappearance. They're all of a sudden they're there, and then the next moment they're gone. So what would you think? See, well, I've had many spirits come to me, and we've had a discussion, and all of a sudden there was a group of, say, two or three hundred spirits, and all of a sudden half of the spirits start disappearing. And the other half will get frightened, say, where are they gone? Where are they gone? Like, because they thought they might have died or something.